Hey, thanks for checking in for Thermodynamics Day 2. We're going to be talking a little bit today about uh, one of three sort of relationships that Gibbs Free Energy has with some of the other topics that we've covered. Um, today, the relationship will be kind of exploring how delta G, the change in Gibbs Free Energy, that idea, again, of available energy, um, how it relates to thermochemistry. So really, at first, at least, simply to delta H. But there'll be more besides just delta H as we kind of delve into this a little bit. Um, just to quickly recap, delta G remembers this concept of available energy. So Gibbs free energy is uh, this idea of, you know, can the energy uh, produced by a reaction leave the reaction or does it need to be constantly absorbed by the reaction? If it can leave the reaction, that's a negative delta G. So that means that the reaction is favorable. The reaction can work. It can produce available energy because it gives it away. That's that loss, that negative delta G. And a positive delta G means that it is non-favorable. The reaction needs to constantly absorb energy like that. So that positive value implying that it's a constant increase in delta G for the system. And in order for it to increase as a system, the energy has to come from somewhere, uh, a.k.a. the surroundings. Um, so really the, the most common tie then for delta G historically and in some ways uh, certainly on the, the way the AP has treated it, would be that it relates most closely to, to thermochemistry. Obviously, there's a relationship in the etymology of thermodynamics and thermochemistry. They both have that heat relationship. And so that was sort of early on how scientists began to understand thermodynamics a little bit better because of understanding of how machines and engines and things like that worked. Um, the concept of engineering and heat and expansion of gases, moving pistons and engines and things like that is a very uh, common thread in sort of the understanding of engineering and thermodynamics early on. So what scientists noticed, though, is that just because a reaction was exothermic didn't mean that it had available energy. So exothermic reactions uh, didn't always uh, produce available energy. In other words, just because a reaction has a negative delta H doesn't mean that it has a negative delta G. So a negative delta H doesn't always lead uh, to negative delta G. And that's uh, kind of a, an interesting idea because, as I mentioned in the video for a previous class, an exothermal reaction tends to be favorable, but is not guaranteed to be. And so scientists sort of realized that there was another factor. This is something that they had begun to study in the late 1800s. Um, and they ended up sort of coming to this idea of what's called entropy. Um, so the other factor is what we call entropy. Uh, entropy is defined in, in many ways. Some uh, refer to it as time's arrow, which we'll maybe talk briefly about. Some refer to it as a tendency towards disorder. Um, that's kind of the definition I prefer personally. Um, so the tendency towards disorder is uh, certainly a conceptual framework to understand this, but is really based on a mathematical framework. Um, it's based on the number of possible arrangements of particles. So, um, essentially they use that term, they use the term microstates. And microstates would imply like every possible arrangement of particles. So imagine, if you will, the incredible... Uh, set of math problems you would have to, to figure out the probability of certain states of like a mole of gas particles. I mean, that's just so many particles that can be arranged in so many ways given the amount of empty space that's in there. So a solid, for instance, has very little entropy because solids don't have a lot of possible arrangements because their particles don't really move very much. A liquid has more because the liquid particles move around more. A gas particle has an incredible amount of disorder because of how much its particles can move around how much empty space there is. And so there's so many uh, possible arrangements or microstates. And scientists that sort of work with this early on uh, invented sort of a field called statistical mechanics that's trying to sort of explain this. And they were doing this, you know, at the turn of the 20th century uh, when really the computational abilities weren't there to do the kinds of number crunching we can these days. So it was a very uh, hard thing to do mathematically. And it was certainly also at a time when the idea of atoms wasn't fully understood or even appreciated or even believed in by some scientists. So uh, one of the chief scientists involved uh, in this, uh, Ludwig Boltzmann, uh, proposed this idea and 
really did not receive support for it because scientists either didn't believe in atoms or couldn't believe that this mathematical approach could possibly explain all these things. And he uh, sunk into a deep depression and ended up taking his own life as a result. And, and now, of course, the equation for its relationship to entropy and microstates appears on his tombstone. So a rather sad tribute to someone who was apparently too far ahead of his time to be fully understood. Um, so this idea then of uh, what goes on with microstates, certainly if we go from solid uh, to liquid to gas, you're increasing the amount of possible microstates. And when you increase the number of microstates or arrangements, what you're doing is increasing the probability that those microstates are disordered. So there's also an increase in disorder. Solids are pretty orderly. Liquids are not too orderly, but they're not nearly as disordered as gases are. And so there's an increase in disorder when you go from things that are solid and arranged nicely to liquids and gases. Essentially, if you want to think about it, it's almost like uh, for a gas, if you had a deck of playing cards, you know, 52 cards in a deck, and you shuffle them, the chances that they end up in a in a an arrangement that is orderly, like all the same suits, or all the twos, all the threes, all the fours, uh, those are very low compared to the number of random arrangements. And so the chances of disorder is simply a statistical likelihood as opposed to some mandate or order. And so it's just far more likely that you get a random arrangement of particles. And you get more likelihood of those random arrangements in gases than you do in liquids than you do in solids. Well, because of that statistical likelihood then, reactions uh, that increase in disorder, in other words, maybe they make solids into liquids or solids and liquids into gases, or they just make more gases than they use up, reactions that increase disorder are favorable. In other words, they're just statistically more likely to occur. Uh, they're just, you know, the chances are really good that a reaction that makes disorder is likely to happen simply because that's what tends to happen naturally because the chances of making order are really low. And in fact, creating order takes an immense amount of energy. And so you have to put in energy to make order. And in doing so, as it turns out, in a strange loophole of the universe, you make more disorder along the way. So it, you can imagine if you try to uh, clean up your room to reduce the entropy in your room, you have to put in energy to do that. You have to eat food in order to get that energy. And where does that food come from? And so there's sort of this backtrack of where all the energy came from and all the disorder that tracks along the way in order to make that possible. Uh, but as usual, I digress. So anytime you have an increase in disorder, we refer to that as a positive delta S. Delta S is the symbol for the change in entropy. So this would be an increase in entropy. Uh, people laugh a lot of times when I say this, but it's almost like you can read this as an increase in dis, ds, delta s, disorder. So there's an increase in disorder. A positive ds is an increase in disorder. So there's more disorder. Um, so as it turns out, then the two things that make reactions favorable from a thermochem perspective, we call driving forces. And those two driving forces then would be exothermicity, so a negative delta H and a positive delta S. If you have one of those two things, the reaction is likely to be favorable, but not guaranteed to be. If you have both of them, the reaction is guaranteed to be favorable. So if you have one factor, tends to be favorable. If you have both, it's guaranteed to be. Now you've, you've caught me with a spelling mistake. Uh, so it's guaranteed to be favorable. So the way that this works quantitatively, I'll sneak it onto this page and then, and then we'll uh, look at it in more detail with a couple of examples here later on, is delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. Uh, it's one of three mathematical expressions that we're going to talk about in this unit one today and two in our next class. Um, because Josiah Willard Gibbs had three names that he sort of went by, uh, a student once referred to this as Josiah's Law, so we could have three different laws that we could re easily refer to by name. So sometimes we call this Josiah's Law, but nobody else in the world, I believe, would refer to it as Josiah's Law. So 
the relationship here is simply that uh, delta G is a function of both delta H and delta S. And we'll get into that in an example problem here in just a second. So let's say that we have <clears throat> an example reaction uh, that we can kind of explore here. Let's say that our example is going to be a combustion reaction. Let's say it's the combustion of propane. There's the combustion of propane. And we know because it's a combustion reaction that there's a negative delta H as combustion reactions are strongly exothermic. Um, we also, if we think about the amount of disorder, one easy way and very important way and, and way that is often uh, tested in a rather simple fashion to assess disorder is to count the number of gas particles. Here we have six moles of gases on the reactant side and on the product side we have seven. And that means that we have created more gas particles than we had used and if we create more gas particles we've created disorder. So uh, there's an increase in the moles of gas so that's a positive delta S, that's more disorder. So this particular reaction has both driving forces. And because it has both driving forces, it's guaranteed to be favorable all the time. So combustion reactions are favorable under all conditions. Um, and that's, I think, pretty intuitive for a combustion reaction. We know that they tend to work pretty well. Remember that in the previous video, I mentioned that the old term used for this was spontaneous. The idea of a reaction like this being spontaneous is, again, a bit of a misnomer given common jargon. Uh, this reaction is not spontaneous. Propane tanks just don't spontaneously explode because both driving forces are present. They still require activation energy. So a common way that this is sometimes trickily uh, assessed on tests is, you know, even though this reaction is listed to be favorable, it does not proceed at room temperature on its own. And you have, you have to sort of say, well, it needs activation energy. Once a spark is applied, the activation energy is applied. And once the activation energy is there, off the reaction goes. So that's sometimes... Uh, pops up. All right, I'm going to move on to the next slide just to give us enough room to talk about the second and final example problem that we'll do for the day. So that second one is a reaction where limestone, one of the main ingredients in limestone, calcium carbonate, does decompose into calcium oxide and CO2 gas. Uh, that reaction is actually quite endothermic. You need to provide a fair bit of heat energy in order to break uh, the limestone down into its constituents and drive off the gas. So that's endothermic. So we don't have that driving force. So this would be a non-favorable thing. But you'll note that this reactant side has zero moles of gases. And the product side has one. So we have increased the number of gas particles. And because we've increased the number of gas particles, we actually have increased the amount of disorder. So because we've increased the amount of disorder, that is a driving factor. It's just, again, statistically more likely that this is an arrangement you'd find rather than an orderly arrangement of particles. Disorder is much more uh, natural than order is. If you think about the state of your room or my classroom or my desk, it's far more likely that that gets disordered than it randomly cleans or orders itself. You have to put in energy in order to make things order. So there's more disorder in this particular reaction. So this has one driving force, but not both. So what that means is that the reaction will uh, work at some temperatures favorably and not at others. So it's a temperature dependent. Uh, so the favorability is a function of temperature. So if we look back at the equation, delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. A lot of times I sort of think of this then as sort of delta H plus negative T delta S. And that sort of gives me two different terms. And we're going to assess the term for delta H and then the sort of three-part term here for negative T delta S. Well, delta H in this case is positive. That tends to lead to a positive delta G. And then if I say plus a negative T delta S, well, negative is always negative. T temperature in this case is the Kelvin temperature, which is always positive. That's an important thing to keep in mind. We won't do math problems with this 
but it's something to keep in mind. And delta S in this case is also positive. So a negative times a positive times a positive is overall negative. So we actually have two terms here, one of which is positive, one of which is negative. The negative term leads to a negative delta G. So we have sort of two competing terms here, a positive delta S and a negative T delta S sort of portion of things. And whichever one wins determines whether the reaction is overall favorable or not. If the positive is larger, the reaction is not favorable. If the negative is larger, the reaction is overall, overall favorable. So that essentially means if the negative term's magnitude is bigger than the positive term's magnitude, we'll get a favorable reaction. Well, that is dependent on temperature. So as temperature goes up, this term gets larger. The magnitude grows larger, I should say. Not just the term, but the magnitude. And if the magnitude of this term increases, then we get a situation where the negative magnitude is greater than the positive magnitude and the reaction overall is favorable. So for this reaction, as temperature increases, so does favorability. In other words, this reaction works better when it's warmer, which makes sense because as it turns out, it takes heat to break calcium carbonate down. So the warmer it is, the more likely you are to get this reaction to happen. In fact, and we may talk about this a little bit in the next video, you can find at what temperature the switch sort of flips from being non-favorable to favorable because delta G, as I mentioned in the previous video, when you hit equilibrium, delta G is zero. So if I set delta G equal to zero, I then can have a relationship where delta H would equal T delta S if I just rearrange the terms. And I can solve for T by saying that T equals delta H over delta S, and I can then solve for the temperature at which a reaction changes from being favorable to not favorable if it's a reaction like this that has one of the two driving forces. Okay, I know this has been a lot. Uh, we'll kind of stop there. We'll talk a little bit more about that to start the next uh, classes video, as well as the two remaining laws, Willard's Law and Gibbs's Law, so to speak, where we talk about how delta G relates to electrochemistry and how it relates to equilibrium. Those are much simpler and easier laws and concepts to process. So just remember there are two driving forces for these kinds of reactions from a thermochem perspective. Negative delta H's, exothermic reactions tend to make reactions favorable, and positive delta S's, more disordered reactions, usually reactions that produce more gases, also tend to be favorable. All right, have yourselves a great day, and we'll talk to you on the next one.